All right. Well, uh, great job to Jennifer and Stephanie. Uh, just wealth of information there that that kind of sets the foundation for uh, a really strong soil health system that that relies a lot on these beneficial organisms. And so, I guess my part is then going to be well, if I'm a farmer or if I'm someone working with farmers. Uh, how do I how do I implement this successfully and practically on my farm? And why would I want to anyway? Uh, what are some of the drivers that would that would really lead me down this path? And so, I'll try to hit on uh, as many of those as I can get through today. But um, you know, uh, as we make these kind of management shifts from our conventional uh, systems out there to more of a soil health management system, not all of the management is always intuitive even for the best farmers uh you know out there so it's not it, it it's just there are some just small uh you know uh strategies that that can be overlooked uh and lead to uh, some some uh roadblocks or or lead to some unintended consequences that 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 can actually easily be avoided but but they're not always intuitive so I'll try to hit a few of those and um, uh, go through, and hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the at the end. So, um, so if we build our uh, soil health system on really sound principles, we'll we'll go into the you know those same management principles, but we'll talk about from a practical standpoint how to do that. But I guess first of all, I guess I, you know maybe it would be easy for farmers to become a bit complacent or or wonder why. Why would I really need to make many changes at a time when it seems like my yields are doing pretty good? And, you know, across the country, corn yields, for example, have been increasing pretty steadily. Uh, however, most of that increase has been driven by, by genetics and technology and equipment advancements and, and uh, basically low cost inputs. Now, those of you today would say if you if you buying inputs they maybe you wouldn't call them low cost compared to even last year but 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 all in all inputs are relatively low and and can be added uh, pretty pretty uh, efficiently um, to your cropping system when we look at these yield increases though they have been at the expense of uh, of our soil carbon and we know today, you know, based on even the last uh, college textbook that's used across the country, Nature and Properties of Soil, the, light, the latest edition that Ray Weil put in there showed all of the fractions of organic matter being important. And what we've heard today is we not only lost, you know, we've known for a long time that we've lost a lot of that stable portion of organic matter, that stable fraction, we call it humus uh, a lot of times. It's that number that you see on your soil test. However, after today, we, we see that we're also at, uh, placing at risk a lot of our living portions of organic matter. And, and you know, in, in the nature and properties of soil, they go into how important the labile and living portions of organic matter are to a cropping system and to soil functions uh, because they are the ones doing a lot of the cycling of, of nutrients, cycling and building water stable aggregates and things like that that are so important to, to soil function. So, so we have to look at all the pools of organic matter. And of course, this living, fun this living pool that we've been talking about today is just as important as anything. So if we look at you know, that definition of soil health, the continued capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and us, uh, then we, we have to focus on these functions because if I'm a farmer, I'm gonna understand these functions, many of these functions. And if I can make these functions, uh, make this soil function at a higher level, then, then, then that's going to uh, come back to me in the way of productivity and resilience and, and yield and, and things like that. So we know that these are just a few of the really key functions that we want that soil to have. And it's, so nutrient cycling, we, we need that soil to supply and, and, and cycle nutrients to our crops so that we have a healthy crop. 
water is everything for our cropland. And, and so infiltration. And then once the water gets into the soil, we have to make sure that it has a holding capacity and, an, uh, and can make water available to the crop for longer periods of time. We need the filtering and buffering. We need stability and support to even support our equipment, but to, to support our plants. So we need that function uh, to be strong in our soil. And it's not always. And then ultimately what we spent a lot of time this morning on is, is, you know, we have to have a soil that provides that habitat for all the organisms, all the biodiversity. And so if we do that, then that, those organisms will turn right around and go, go back up here to the top. Let me grab a, a, a pointer here. What goes clear to the top. You know, if we've got good biodiversity, if we've got all the organisms working for us, they come back and they help us with the nutrient cycling and the water infiltration and the buffering. So, so it's a big circle here, but all of these functions are really critical to productivity and resilience to extreme weather, weather and, and, and all of those uh, things that can happen to us during a cropping system, cropping season. Okay. So uh, unfortunately, in many parts of our, uh, since we've lost a lot of the, these organic matter pools, we've also lost the functions that go along with them. And some of the, some of the very best crop land in the country is suffering a loss of function. And so, you know, when, when we have this soil, that's even flat as a table. We think, well, that soil doesn't have erosion problems. That, that soil can take a lot of tillage. It can take a lot of things and be just fine. But the reality is, when that soil breaks down, when we don't have aggregate stability at the soil surface, then, then very important functions are lost. And it's, it's just as bad as really bad erosion from that standpoint. So when those soil particles break loose, they actually detach, they actually transport down into the pore space directly below. And then, and then that's their deposition as well. So, so then they're causing as much of a functional loss as severe erosion as if that soil left the field. Okay, so what we really want is we want to manage a soil that has, as you know, a really good indicator is, is does that soil have water stable aggregates? You know, we want a soil that when the raindrops hit, the water goes in. It, wherever a raindrop hits, it, it has a chance to go into the matrix of the soil and be stored there for later in the cropping system. Unfortunately, what we have in a lot of situations is when that soil breaks down, as soon as it hits water, it has a bad relationship with water. And, and then those individual soil particles plug up the pore space. And now we can't get the next rain in the, in the soil. We have ponding all over our fields. We have erosion. We have runoff. Okay. So this is just one example of the kind of indicator we're going to look for as soil health improves. And keep in mind that a, a, a soil that lets water in also lets air in. If it lets air in, now you're starting to rebuild that, that habitat for those important soil organisms. The one that doesn't breathe, the one that doesn't allow water movement is also a habitat that's, that's very limited for many of our really beneficial organisms. We've got some in-field uh, tests that gives us a pretty good uh, pretty objective actually measure of whether or not we're, we're gaining these functions, where we're regenerating these functions and whether soil health is headed in the right direction. This is just one and this, we can go through a, several of these and that's for another day. We'll go into that, you know, maybe in, in greater detail or we can, but, but we have in-field soil health assessments that, that now can, can provide us pretty quick uh, evaluation on which direction we're headed with it from a soil health standpoint. So we, I'm gonna spend most of my time on practices and, and, and how the system is put together. I'm just giving you kind of a, a baseline of why, uh, but, but we know through, through experience on farms, we, through, through research, we can regenerate these functions. We can regenerate soil health. We can regenerate these organic soil, organic matter pools, uh, so that we can have those functions back. And, and you know, there's, there's single practices can do a little, uh, multiple practices can do a lot, but a, but, a, but a comprehensive system that involves many other practices, technologies, and activities uh, 
will will regenerate soil function uh, uh, the fastest. And you know we we've we've learned these uh, we've learned these from some of these best farm managers that you've that that you've uh, you know you've seen pictures you see videos you see uh, you know the, these guys have been out in the forefront learning. Uh, a lot of the practical aspects, how to get this done, how to how to integrate these systems and still maintain yield, still maintain economic viability and sustainability on their farm. And so, you know, when you when you hear these folks, they're sharing a lot of their own personal inf information how how to how to put this system together. So, uh, and that's where we we ground truth, you know. Uh, folks like me that have worked for USDA for most of my life, uh, the, the advantage is we get to work with a lot of these really top producers and scientists across the country, put those two, put the science together with the practical application learned on these farms, and we can, we can come up with some pretty logical and sound recommendations and for, for systems that still get the environmental outcomes, get the benefits that we're looking for, while it's at the still at the same time gives us a, a sustainable uh, you know economic uh, situation on our farm. <clears throat> Stephanie talked about these principles, and I'll just touch them real quick here. You know, when we talk about a, a management system that's practical, in the very back of our mind, we still do have to have these management principles. You know, for every farm the actual practice combination may be slightly different, but it will almost always be founded if it's really successful on these, on these sound soil health management principles. And so we break these into the, the you know, the protection ones that, that we talk about, you know, we think about minimizing disturbance and, and Stephanie mentioned, or uh, I think it was Stephanie mentioned that when we talk about disturbance, we're not just talking about tillage. We, there are, there's chemical disturbance and biological disturbance at the same time that we need to keep in the back of our mind. And, but, but we have to stop some of that disturbance to protect the habitat. We have to maximize soil cover because most organisms benefit from that blanket of protection that's over the surface and the aggregates won't break down as quickly uh, uh, if we have maximum cover. But if we're going to truly regenerate, and we're talking about rebuilding pools of organic matter, re which, and, which means ultimately rebuilding and feeding organisms that are going to help us regenerate those soil functions, regenerate the soil organic matter pools, then we're going to have to have a feeding strategy, okay? And that's where we have, you know, maximizing living roots, uh, you know, we're gonna, and we're going to maximize diversity. And, and so, you know, across the Midwest, it's corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans, and that's not very diverse. And so that's why we do talk about cover crops a lot. That's why a lot of producers are bringing some livestock back into the rotation to get that diversity back. But we have to have living roots there more than just our summer crops because, because it's the living roots that are ultimately feeding those important organisms uh, that live below the surface that are going to give us those benefits. Okay, so a lot of times I talk to farmers and I say, well, have you ever seen where these, so these soil principles really play out and, and prove themselves? And so I, I always show them this, and this is just an aerial photograph that has en enhanced color imagery. And we, you know, we see the color of the, of the crop uh, indicates its health and, and will ultimately lead to differences in yield. So these light colored areas are a less healthy crop. The low areas are a more healthy crop. There's generally more organic matter there. There's, there's less erosion there. There's more water there. So they're where you think they should be. However, there is one anomaly here on, on this, uh, uh, this slide that that goes above and on the hills, below the hills, all the way through, and it stays a nice dark green indicating the crop color is 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 good, indicating crop health is good. So so is anybody you know be thinking about what do you think that is? What's showing up there? What did that used to be before it became cropped? And and so we basically know that that's a fence row. 
we, we've got an old old uh, uh, ownership boundary line here that that that's not only a fence row, it's a property line fence row. So it was there for a long period of time. And so we have that fence row effect that has really high soil health, whether it's high ground or low ground all the way through. And so let's let's go back to our four principles for just a second. If we think about it, what we're, what what does that fence row have that the rest of the field doesn't have throughout its most of its history? Well, it's had very little disturbance. It's had it's had quite a bit of cover on it most of the time. It's had continuous living roots, and it's had quite a bit of diverse, diversity. So it's had our four principles in place throughout its history. And so when it does come into cropping, cro a cropping scenario, it's a very, very productive area. And if you look at these, anybody that's had a, looked at a yield map and they've seen where an old fence row was or maybe a pasture got converted, we know that those are the most productive places whether it's a good year or bad year, they have a they have a resilience to them to to really be highly productive areas. And so can we can we get that fence row effect though on more than just the fence row? Do we understand enough about how to implement those four principles to get that benefit across the entire field? Well, some of those farmers that I was showing you pictures before and many other farmers that have out there been exercising this for a long period of time, they, they, who have, have implemented those four principles across the entire uh, farming landscape, across the higher field, they get, they get to enjoy that benefit uh, and, and the yield resilience during wet years, dry years, uh, uh, year after year. Because once we understand how to manage for those four principles, we truly do regenerate soil function. And, and that's what we call soil health. We have higher soil health, which gives us a more resilient cropping system. Okay. So I'm going to stop here and just let you think about that for just a second before we go further. And we've got some polling questions I think Liz is going to bring up for us. Okay, so let's let's just make sure we're refreshed. We, we we really need to get this. So choose the two soil health principles that feed the soil ecosystem because that's how we regenerate. All right, lots of answers coming in. So I'll give this another 20 or 30 seconds here. Okay, we're at 45 seconds, so we're going to give it about 15 more seconds, so go ahead and get those answers in if you haven't had a chance to yet. All right, let's take a look at those results. Okay, so good. Sounds like we're, 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 We've caught most of that, at least. You know, the minimizing disturbance and maximizing cover is still important, but if we're really going to feed the soil ecosystem, we do have to maximize the biodiversity and get those continuous living roots out there for a lot of those organisms. And so, so uh, uh, that's that. You all are paying attention. That's good. <laughs> so, all right, I'll go ahead. Uh, I'll go ahead on because if we if we want to do that, then let's just I'm going to look at a very simplistic and very practical uh, system here. You know, we're going to talk about here. I'm here in the Midwest. I'm I'm from Indiana, so we need to take a look at what are the practices. What would that suite of practices look like that would be most practical for us to achieve those four principles? And and so we've talked about them. Stephanie introduced those. You know no-till, uh, good nutrient management, uh, diverse crop rotation, uh, cover crops, and maybe integrate some grazing. And then, and then definitely integrated pest management or, that, or, or the uh, pest management conservation system. 
okay? Now, what I wanna point out real quickly here though is when you hear someone talk about no-till, notice I put the word quality no-till. Quality no-till is not the same as, you know, no-till is not a thing. There's a lot of different ways to integrate no-till into your system. There's a lot of different strategies behind no-till. There's a lot of different purposes for no-till. So if one of our purposes is to provide better habitat for soil organisms, or if one of our purposes is to build organic matter, then there's actually criteria that you would want to follow that's different. Even in the, the NRCS uh, field office technical guide, it lists multiple purposes for the practice no-till. And, and, and then within each uh, purpose, there's, there's different sets of criteria. So, so I, I just want to bring very few of these practices have a single, you know, that the, they're not just a thing. Uh, cover crops are not a thing. You have to know why am I planting cover crops in the first place? What's my purpose? What's my primary purpose in order to be able to put together a really good management strategy to accomplish that purpose? So if, if building beneficial organisms in your you know, throughout your, your soil profile and, and across your landscape is an important thing, then you're going to manage cover crops differently. You're going to have a different crop rotation. You're going to manage your nutrients different, and you're certainly going to have a different pest management plan. Okay, so, but all of these will play on each other. You know, if I add cover crops, then my no-till system will change. If I add cover crops, my nutrient management and my nutrient delivery from the soil is going to change. So I'm going to need to adapt my nutrient management. Same way with pest management. Anytime we add one of these practices, it will likely affect the other practices. So we have to have all of these practices working collaboratively together uh, so that they're complementing each other. And, and we can't let one of them uh, be a train wreck for the rest of our system. Okay, so there's no way to go through all of this today, but we need a real strategy for our system. And I'll just give you a few highlights here of some examples, what I'm talking about by having a really solid game plan. Okay, so the, I'm, I'm just going to cover a few things really quickly. Nutrient management first, then I'll do cover crop and some pest management and, and, and talk about some weather, weather related, uh, you know, resilience effects. So let me just briefly mention and this isn't the whole thing, but, 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 but I just want to mention a few nutrient management key things that we have to understand. And so if we're going to have a really good nutrient management plan, you know, many of you have heard about the four R's. You're going to apply uh, for fertility at, at the right place, right time, right source, right rate, right? They, they, all, they all start with right so that's why they're the four r's okay so that's that's a good um uh good foundation however when we start switching to no-till and we start switching to a soil health management system where we're really trying to build soil organic matter and and we're going to manipulate the organisms that are delivering nutrients in the soil then we have to have included in, in our nutrient management plan, we have to include the soil organic matter, all the pools of the soil organic matter, and the organic nutrient contribution, because the soil is going to play a big role in how the nutrients ultimately get to your crop. Okay, and this is just a, a real quick example. Here's a, here's a nitrogen uh, a nitrogen model, you know, that shows the nitrogen cycle. And, and you, you're seeing all this, you know, in, here, are your, here are your inputs, organic and urea, for example. Uh, they go through a chemical reaction and they, they change to ammonium. And then there's other potential chemical reactions to, to you know, that maybe would, would lead to even volatilization. But then uh, more chemical reactions convert this to, to nitrate. And I hope all of you are squirming out there as I'm saying chemical reaction, chemical reaction, because are these chemical reactions only? Every one of these are driven by biology. These are biochemical reactions. Okay, so what we do to the soil and what we do to the soil biology that was covered earlier today, that's going to affect 
the soil's delivery of nutrients and the soil's effect on the nutrient cycles. We have to understand that if we're going to have a full system. If we've been in a full width tillage system our entire farming career, and we switch to now something that is going to be far more biologically driven, then some of our standard practices and, and the timing of some of our standard practices will really need to be adapted to get full credit and to get fully util full utilization of that biology. It can be a huge benefit or it can be a major stumbling block if we don't know that this change is going to happen. And so, so we want to talk about that just a little bit, okay? First of all, We've got a lot of data and, and a lot of farmers and even crop consultants such as myself, we forget that agronomists like, you know, we, we forget that nature intended plants to get their nutrients in this relationship with the soil biology. Okay, so no matter how good a job we do on the four R's, about half of that nutrient that winds up in the plant is just going to come from biological delivery and soil delivery systems. Okay, because nature intended it that way. So if we leave that out of the equation, then then we could easily miss huge opportunities or 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 be dinged on 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 yield because we just didn't know that was going to happen that way. And here here's just a real brief example that I have to share. In a in a full width tillage system, which was typical here in this blue line or the, the blue graph. You know, we get a lot of respiration and we measure that respiration. That's microbial activity. We get that through a respiration test, okay? Because so we see this big peak in microbial activity uh, early in the season. And just think about that for a second. What did we just do uh, early in the season? Uh, you know, what, what just happened? Well, tillage effect. The, the spring tillage pass happened. When we did that, we injected oxygen, we broke apart a bunch of new food sources, and so the microbial population and activity just explodes. As it does that, the soil is releasing a lot of soluble and plant available nutrients early in the season, okay? So if that's what all of our genetics, that's what all of our system is based on, that that is the, that is the norm, then when we switch to no tillage system, and if we even add cover crops, it's even 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 more extreme. Then that respiration, that microbial activity spike in the spring doesn't happen. It it lasts much further into the season, which should be really good. In other words, it's going to spoon feed more nutrients uh, and deliver more nutrients later in the season. But we're not going to get that early spring spike, which which may have been part of why we selected certain certain genetics over time certain hybrids over time because they capitalized on that so just just know that if we're going to try to keep the same kind of yield as we make a, a change we're going to have to adapt our nutrient management system a timing the timing may need to change and fortunately we have technology it's an easy thing to manage around if you know this isn't gonna if if this could happen so so we have we can precision place just just some of those early nutrients early on, you know, as starter or early in the season uh, that would offset that spike. We still get to enjoy the slower release from 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 the respiration from the microbial activity later in the year. But if our hybrid was really needing that early early boost that it was selected from, then we can easily offset that with our planters. We're not talking about putting more nutrients on, but we're, we are changing the timing. So what I mean by, here's one that if you didn't know that was going to happen, then it could bite you. But if you do know that it's going to happen, now you can play it to your favor. You can enjoy those late season releases uh, that are going to occur uh, without without taking a hit early in the se growing season. And, and this is mostly I'm talking about corn for, from this standpoint. So this is just one example how we would need to adapt our nutrient management once we make this major shift. And I just, that, that's just a, a quick example. There's a lot more strat to that entire nutrient management strategy that we would have to cover another time. But let's talk about adding a cover crop, for example. 
So, so same thing. It's going to have an effect on your overall cropping system. So you need to make sure that your cover crop selection, your termination strategies, make sure that that's going to keep you sustainable. And because, because, you know, we want to get these benefits. We want to build these, you know, if we can build that population of beneficial organisms, then we want to be able to build that without ha having to sacrifice a lot of our economic gains. Okay. So, so, so this is, these are just little strategies to help us integrate some of these practices while still uh, getting some of the benefits that we've already talked about today. Okay. So we've got to have a, we ha got to have a good plan right out of the gate. You've got to know, well, what, what's my purpose of my cover crop? And what's my crop that's going to follow that cover crop? What's my crop that, that preceded that cover crop? And a lot of that uh, has to do with understanding different cover crop makeup, you know, the makeup from a carbon to nitrogen ratio, because the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the residues left on, and, and, and even the growing residues has a lot to do with nutrient cycling. So it's tying even back. Here's where I'm talking about it ties back to your nutrient management because it's going it, it has the potential some of these cover crops and their residues when you let you know rye rye go all the way to anthesis then then it has an immobilization effect on nitrogen which can affect corn it's great for soybeans because soybeans can make their own nitrogen and 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 enjoy the extra growth and, and the extra carbon that builds up from that rye cover crop without sacrificing yield. Corn, on the other hand, can possibly uh, need more mineralized uh, in from the soil. So having a different strategy for your cover crop and it may be a different selection or a different management strategy uh, is gonna be better for that cover crop, okay? So that's just one thing. Uh, from a selection standpoint, you know, we look at, we, we look at this, uh, these these two comparisons here the one on the left that corn's kind of kind of puny and 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 pale in color because it was planted into maybe a cereal rye cover crop that got a little big maybe we didn't have starter fertilizer on the planter so we've immobilized the nitrogen well uh, maybe a better strategy we could have had cereal rye we, just like in this photo here except we can precision plant our cover crop today where our corn row is going to be planted right here in between in the blank row where where uh, that young corn plant doesn't have to compete with those high carbon rye roots and that that that, that you know that um, very hungry for nitrogen rye that's already established out there it doesn't have the competition this way uh, as as bad so that's just one little strategy you could have made a change that would have made a possibly a huge difference in the in the look of this corn right here on the left okay so that's that's just an example okay so maybe maybe we could have a better strategy maybe maybe there's something different that we can do maybe we can just select maybe maybe here's the place especially if I'm early in the cycle this this one on the right actually had a cover crop but it was a winter kill cover crop the cover crop looked good last fall came up last fall did okay, but winter killed, leaving a, a, a cleaner area for the for the corn to grow in. Okay, even the one on the left, at least it was killed prior to seed head form formation, and you can't see it, but there's a lot of Austrian winter pea and crimson clover that's been in that cover crop as well. So, so these, you know, maybe you can you can change, you know, what kind of 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 cover crop that that you select. If you have the window, you know, maybe you could get a legume ahead of corn that would provide a lot of extra nitrogen, uh, it has a lot of benefits to a lot of soil organisms, which could get something like that growing. And you can see the, the nitrogen nodules there on that hairy vetch vet plant, for example. However, you have to make sure you have a window to get that kind of a cover crop established. So you might have to ultimately manage your crop rotation to give you a better window. Okay, so so you just gotta decide in your mind, how important is this? How far am I willing to take this? 
maybe I can add another, maybe a, a, a small grain or something that gives me a wider window to establish this. Maybe I can plant shorter season corn, shorter season beans that gives me a wider window in the fall to get more cover crops established. And then maybe I let that cover crop grow longer in the spring to produce even more nitrogen, give it a chance to bloom in the spring, provide a better habitat for your organisms, you know. So then you've also got to decide, um, are you, um, what is your purpose? And if your purpose is habitat, if your purpose is building soil organic carbon, uh, then maybe you've got to decide how, when am I going to terminate that cover crop? Okay. So if I'm new to the system, I may not want to let that cover crop get, you know, very tall. It, it may be too, too much of a risk for me. So maybe I want to terminate that, that cover crop earlier in the season. Okay. Uh, but if I'm really, you know, getting, getting some confidence then, and, and it gets a little uh, taller, then maybe I want to plant green. You know, there is, there comes a point in the spring of the year when if a cover crop gets too tall, we use that if greater than approach <laughs> because if if your cover crop starts getting too tall and I just use knee high uh, and that's I'm six foot three so knee high to me may not be the same as you so uh, for sure greater than 16 inches or as you, if you start seeing it going into reproductive mode then in all honesty you're probably going to be better off to plant first then terminate or terminate within a day of of, of your planting because one of the worst things you can have is, uh, let me go back, you know, I'll, I'll show you here in a minute, but one of the worst things that can happen is have a cover crop that's big, you kill it, now we get a rain, and now we've got all this cover that's no longer transpiring water out of the soil, now it's it's conserving water, and it's also tougher, ropier, rubbery that you have a hard time planting through. So there comes a point in time where you really need to be strategic in your no-till situation. If no-till is your, for example, you, you need to plant through that standing cover crop and then terminate is probably one of the best ways to do that. Okay. So, so you gotta, you gotta weigh your risks and weigh your goals and objectives to decide, okay, how am I going to even manage that cover crop? uh for for the purpose that is really intended out there okay so i mentioned planting green and we've got some polling questions here that we'll get to uh that, that probably has a question about planting green in it but i really want to get a feel for how you are out there as far as how what's your comfort level with a soil health management system what what are some of the things that 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 you're having. So Liz is going to put up these polling questions maybe that. Yep. Sorry. There's a little lag here, but they should be coming up any moment. There we go. And we'll give about a minute here. <clears throat> And this question relates to that tie back to the nutrient management. Like, like if, if you're new to this system, you know, what's the carbon to nitrogen and what, what's the easiest step in place? All right, I'm gonna close this down and we'll take a look at the results here. Okay, so we're 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 kind of close, and this one this one is one of those managements that's not very intuitive. It's not always intuitive. A lot of people will think, well, I need a cover crop after my soybeans because I need that cover on the soil. But from a sheer economics standpoint, from a sheer if it's I'm new to this, I will just tell you that planting a cover crop after soybeans going to corn 
the corn will suffer in that environment more than soybeans will. So I usually try to get people to go against what is maybe intuitive and, and go with the way that understand the, the soil's delivery of nutrients. And that's going to be better if you plant a cover crop after corn going to soybeans. No-till soybeans into that cover crop as your first practice. That, that gives you a lot more opportunity and less risk than planting corn into a, into a cover crop. And this is mostly early in the, early in the transition stage. Okay. Most people don't jump right into a 12 way cover crop mix. And the only way you would do that really is if you have wheat in your rotation, you've got that window after wheat. Okay. I think we got one more polling question and then Yep, just a moment here, I'll get that up. And I'm sorry, Barry, it looks like my polling has frozen. Um, so we might wanna... Well, well that's fine. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just go on then and, and maybe we'll have that for, for the end, okay? All right, sorry about that. That's, that's fine. We're, we're, uh, we got a few more things to get through here anyway, so. Okay. Get back to where, uh, okay. Okay, so let's talk pest management real quick. And some of this was covered by Stephanie, but I wanna talk more of the practical aspects of this and just, just kind of drive home a couple of messages about pest management. And uh, right out of the gate, that pest management is everything from insects to fungicides to, to nematodes to weeds. And, and so right now, some of your pest management uh, strategies that were just fine for your, this conventional system uh, that's full width tillage and things, it may be counterproductive and have some unintended consequences uh, as we shift to a soil health management system. And the right, one of the first things that comes to mind is, you know, we're being told and, and, and to use more residual herbicides to help control these, these uh, 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 herbicide resistant weeds that are that become resistant, especially to glyphosate, for example, something like mare's tail. We're trying to control mare's tail or water hemp or palmer amaranth. And so a lot of these residuals are now going on later in the season, you know, as a post-emergence. Well, a lot of these residuals can have an effect. If I think I'm going to plant a cover crop, then, then I've got to be able to have a uh, you know, a soil that's not full of residual herbicide that is also hard on the cover crop that I've just selected. So it has to do with selecting which herbicide plan. You can still put together a really sensible herbicide if you're still using, her, you know, if you're using herbicides. You can use something that, that still does the job, but yet leaves a window, leave, leaves you the availability to plant cover crops. It may affect which cover crop you select too that's more tolerant to the chemistry that you used, okay? And so that's just one thing that, that you want to look at. Um, the other thing is this preventative uh, pesticide use, you know, that's like, for example, the seed, some of the seed treatments. And, and I know Stephanie mentioned the, the neonicotinoids um, having, having an effect or, and it, it, uh, uh, these have some real unintended consequences on those really important, uh, um, especially insects. And so, and, but, but also probably some of the, the mycorrhizal fungi, you know, some of the fungicides that, but you as a producer or as a crop consultant have so many choices that, that you might be able to find a choice that has less of an impact, say on mycorrhiza, has less of, a, less of an impact, has less residual effect on, on um, some of the beneficial insects, you for sure, you know, I, I follow the, you know, there's an extension publication out that talks about the efficacy of some of these neonicotinoids on soybeans. And, and quite honestly, I, I think about that all the time. I haven't, I really haven't used any of those for a very long time. Uh, and, you know, I've got fireflies at night. And so they're out there helping me fight slugs and things like that. So, so we have to ask ourselves, what are we putting things on the seed that are going to have unintended consequences? 
maybe there's a real easy choice, especially with soybeans. Why would we put them on soybeans? Maybe we could use the lower rate at least on, on the corn uh, uh, as a starting place and then, and then see how that goes and maybe move from there. But, but maybe move away from preventative type because preventative especially doesn't fit with our, our integrated pest management uh, really, really philosophy. If we look at integrated pest management, uses holistic management practices. It limits pest opportunities like through crop rotations and some other things. Integrates predator prey relationships. And, and, and he's like, how much have we talked about that already today? The benefits of, of the predators out there that can eat the things that would love to eat your crop. And so employs beneficial biology and cultural practices. Just fake fake out, you know, use cover crops sometimes can fake out certain pests and 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 get them out of sync. And uh but but notice that integrated, true integrated pest management systems are seldom based on preventative chemistry. And so and, and then we utilize, you know, if you truly have an outbreak, we understand that you still have to make a living you can use this technology and if you use it wisely then that we don't lose the effectiveness of the chemistry uh through developing resistance you know pests and, and weeds and and uh diseases developing uh resistance to the chemistry if we if we use them sparingly and use them wisely so so that's all part of the true integrated pest management which needs to be part of this soil health management system there's just one example that, you know, every year I see a few uh, army worms, for example, or slugs. This is actually an army worm field of mine that I was watching and, and had significant numbers of, of army worms out there. And I watched it. I kept watching it. Uh, and and every time I went out there and, and, and found an army worm. See, here's an army worm down in here. But look who's look who's waiting here in the wings here. And, and you just keep watching it, keep watching it. And and you know here's here's another another potential predator. You start finding nothing but uh, army worm carcasses and and you know army worm poop is what I think that probably was, but all of a sudden the the damage from the army worms went away without any any pest treatment. Now, I did have in the back of my mind though that that I had selected uh, a traded corn that that should be. Uh, at least a suppressive to to the army worm. So that was in the back of my mind too. But but most most agronomists would have went out there and recommended spray for those army worms immediately. Spray for those army worms. But had I done that, uh, a lot of these a lot of these beneficials would have been would have been taken out as well. Okay. And so if you're building an entire system, you have to really be as good at scouting for your beneficials as you are your pests. And so I use this book a lot. This is not, not because they're sponsoring this workshop, but I've used this for a long time. Uh, you know, it's just a really good resource. And, and what I like about it is it, it has, uh, you know, these different pages and, you know, I guess Firefly, maybe that's the mascot of this training program, Stephanie, but, but these fireflies have, um, uh, a real benefit. And, you know, and, and when we look at this, when we zoom in on this page where we, where we see the firefly and, and you already showed this once before, the common prey is slugs, snails, and caterpillars. And so I know that in my system, I'm going to have a good habitat for slugs. So I know that I need the predators there that like to eat slugs. But if my, if my preventative chemistry would knock out this guy, would knock out my firefly and be hard on fireflies, then they're not there to eat my slugs. So, so my overarching theme, not to uh, completely repeat everything that, that the previous speakers were talking about, uh, I'll just leave it with, you know, leave it from those, you know, those great philosophers known as the Beatles and just maybe we should just let it be. And uh, I'm moving to, uh, some resilience and this is kind of the final thing why we would be interested in this and, and how we would manage for resilience because you know as we know this spring sometimes it just really really rains and here's a downpour in the with sunshine and at the same time it's like we're in the middle of florida around here this year so 
we got to have a successful game plan that's resilient and, and we have to read the weather. And sometimes we even have time, have a hard time, uh, uh, you know, managing these cover crops or managing this system because the weather is, is, is there. However, in our overall game plan, you know, it's been said that the best offense is a good defense. And so maybe in our overarching strategy, it's time to, maybe we need to build defense and, and, and help bring some livestock back to the farm. Cause sometimes, you know, that, that can be another option. You know, it, 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 it not only provides diversity, it's that diversity piece, but it gives us other options in those strange years uh, that, that maybe I'm having a hard time getting this cover crop. Well, at least I've got some economic gain here from that cover crop and, and uh, until things do dry out. The worst thing that can happen is what I started to talk about earlier is if we go ahead and kill that big cover crop, we terminate it, and then it keeps raining. Now we've got a situation where that, that field may never may never dry out. So that's when we do plant green or that's when we do turn the cattle in there and let them let them keep keep working on that cover crop a little bit. At least we're getting gain. We're getting we're, we're getting meat for that for that cover crop being there. If we if we stay with this, you know, have a strategy for the weather extremes and, and we read the weather just like we're reading the defense, then then we'll we'll find a window and we'll, we'll wait. And, you know, even if we have to plant a little bit later, planting later doesn't have the penalty that it does in conventional systems because a plant that's growing here, you know, like, like this corn that's growing here is going to be resilient to the hot, dry weather that may last later in the system, in the season. So, so all, overall, we have to have just a solid game plan. We have to make game time decisions and, and make management changes that, that, that ultimately benefit, but but if we have a good game plan, then we can we can uh, we can still benefit from that. Okay, so uh, that's the kind of crop we look, look we look for. We're looking for good, healthy crops, but we also have good, healthy organisms living below that surface that, throughout the cropping system. If we have really bad weather, if we have really challenging things, don't break out the plow. Don't break out a lot of chemistry. When in doubt, you know, I always tell everybody, when in doubt, if you really want to improve your soil function and soil resilience, when in doubt, plant. Okay, remember your management should should include in the back of your mind these four management, soil health management principles. And then you'll get to, you know, let your crop tell you if your soil's, soil's improving or not. A lot of times your crop will tell you, you know, uh, if you really listen, you're out in the field a lot, you know, it, it, maybe it'll, maybe it'll tell you, but, but you just look at a happy crop and you can tell same goes for your soil. We've got, um, a lot of indicators. We can, we can do a lot of measurements where we, where we can actually maybe not hear the soil, but we can see the soil and see the benefits that are happening and happening from a functional standpoint. Okay. Remember the golden principle, lack of cover is seldom a good thing. And uh, just remember, you know, things don't always go the way you plan, uh, but, but plan anyway. Have a game plan that, 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 that allows you to be successful in multiple, multiple different, different scenarios, just like a really good coach does on the floor. And so uh, if we if we put together these sound sound principles and a good game plan based on these, you know, I've just covered some highlights today. You know, it's a short short time frame. Follow, you know, take advantage of all the courses that are online right now. That uh, take advantage of all the really good farmers that are on YouTube's and, and listen to those things. And 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 well, I tell you, now's the time. There's a lot of drivers to you want you want soil organic matter going back in your soil for a lot of reasons right now and and the first step in that is encourage life back in your soil so so that's it's been a great uh, time of uh, today I've, I've I've really enjoyed the previous speakers and as I always do and and um, uh, anytime I can help well give me a give me a holler. <laughs>